Good morning. Welcome, Southside Bible Church, and grateful for anyone with us this morning visiting. We're always glad to have brothers and sisters come with us and worship our God together. I miss seeing your faces last Sunday, so uh, grateful for the team that pre-recorded in case there was a blizzard. And I always hate canceling, and then it turns out to be two inches, but I felt good uh, last Sunday that we made a good decision. So I was uh, excited about the verse that we looked at last week in Romans 6.14, and I just wanted to fellowship with you over it. So I'm going to give you a longer review this morning so we can kind of celebrate that verse at the end of the service. Well, we are moving into the Easter season, and I'm a little messed up as to when it is, but next, <laughs> next Sunday, we're going to have a sermon on the triumphal entry. Uh, I'm going to be doing a wedding in Arizona, and uh, I pray I, I come back. So I'm, I'm not a snow guy. I love the warmth. So then Good Friday, we will look at the cross, and we're going to have communion together at that service, and then we'll have Resurrection Sunday service with a gospel message and a pancake breakfast uh, before that. So do the work of an evangelist. Um, this is a time to bring people to hear of a risen Savior who's able to save the uttermost, all who draw near to God through Him. Uh, community groups start back up, so I just encourage you to lock in and dig into one of those uh, groups. Well, this morning, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 6, we're going to continue our study there. I want to review uh, how we fight sin as a justified believer in Christ. And that's the section that we're in. And what we've learned so far is Paul has said, knowing, you need to know this truth. This truth, these indicative statements of what God has done, that when you believed you were joined to Christ, you died to sin's rule and reign, you were buried with Christ, and when Christ was raised, you've been raised to walk and a whole uh, new way, newness of life, new creation. And then we saw in verse 11 that you, you need to know these things, but you need to reckon them. You need to reckon into your heart that these things are true, and I'm not a slave to sin, and I don't have to live like that any longer. And then we looked at verses 13, 12, and 13. Uh, Do not let sin reign in your bodies so that you obey it's lust, and that word for lust we saw was epithumias. Thumias are desires, epithumias are our over-desires, and we'll look at that again a little this morning. And then he said, don't give your members to sin. Sin has no members of its own. It needs your eyes and hands and feet. So you no longer say, here's sin, here's my members, I'll serve you. But give these members now to God. God, here I am. Take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I give my members for the service of the King of Kings. And then last week we saw, do not let sin reign then. Uh, let me read it to you. I'm blowing it. For sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under law, but you're under grace. And so I want to remind you of some of the examples that I shared with you about Thumias becoming epithumias back in Romans 6, 12. And then I want to show you how that now works in, in 6, 14. So what I'm after as we just begin here is I, I don't want you to just learn these things. I want you to know them and reckon them and live into them. And so I want to help just make some practical application as we begin. We looked at James 4, and James says, what is the quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not your epithumias? The reason you're fighting and quarreling is these over-desires of things that you want or things where you feel someone wronged you, and they're such a strong desire that you're fighting and having conflicts among you. And so, uh, how do I fight that? Well, I fight it in Romans 6, 14, as I'm no longer under the law. I'm not under that Mosaic law anymore, that law that just stirred up sin and brought condemnation. It revealed God's righteous character, but there was something wrong with me not the law. And so I'm not under that any longer. I'm under grace where I'm accepted by God by the work of Christ. I stand in his favor and in his power toward me now as sin has been broken. So I have everything under grace. What more could I want that I don't have? 
You will not give your members to sin with harsh words and anger when you're living into grace. Anger's coming because I think I need more. I want more. I want this. I want my wife to treat me this way. I want my kids to respect me. And there's these things that are over desires. And when I get under grace, I have every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I I don't have to fight and wage war for anything because I have everything in Christ. Don't give your members to arguing and screaming and having conflicts. The other we looked at was fear. Something you want or love is threatened and you begin to worry. And, and, and an epi is now when you, that happens, you fall apart and you can't control your anxiety because you're so anxious now. How do you fight that under grace? Well, I, I have all things in Christ. God's grace is working for me. I will lose nothing that is not the best for me, designed by perfect wisdom of God. I live under a God who loves me and is working my life out exactly according to plan. And I don't have to fear and live in anxiety of my next meal or my jobs because I have a God who's for me. You're under grace. He's not just looking to clobber you at the next corner. That's living under law. I live under grace. We looked at sadness, and let's say that you lose something very valuable or important to you, and you're kind of blue, and you're kind of down, and we said an epi is now you want to throw yourself off a bridge. You want to die. There's no meaning in life. There's self-condemnation and self-hatred. I can never measure up to what God wants. I just keep coming short. I'm worthless. I'm good for nothing. How do we fight that? By grace, I'm loved by God, and he looks at me as if I lived the life that Jesus Christ lived, and he rejoices over me, and he's declared me not guilty. I'm in the inner circle. I don't have to spend my whole life fighting to get into the accepted group. There's no condemnation. Why am I condemning myself? If I will enter into grace, I can fight that epithumia that's wrecking my life this morning. We looked at the sin of anger. You get upset when someone cuts you off on the highway. An epi is something or someone that they keep you from getting that epithumia and you're unglued. You can't forgive them. You're seething at them. How do I fight that under grace? <laughs> Anger's in the heart because you're mad or you're disappointed at how your life is going. You don't like where you're at. You don't like the choices you've made. And you're just always got this anger in your heart ready to let it out on somebody. How do I fight that by grace? Because again, God is working everything for my good. He's working every detail, my mistakes, everything that I've ever done. God's behind fashioning and working to make me like Christ. Grace can bring peace into your life. You don't have to live with anger and just walk around all the time ready to unleash. I'm loved by God. I'm accepted in Christ. A workaholic. I just want status. I just want achievement. I just got to accomplish and prove that I really am somebody. And grace is I can rest, that I have status, and I'm a child of God. I can live into that position. The politics of 2020. Grace is here. I have no lasting city. But I am a part of the kingdom of God, and that's my blessed hope. Living for male or female attention Grace is I'm justified and I have God's favor. What I want you to see is the power that you're not under law, but you're under grace. And I just, as a pastor, I want to see people live under grace and not live under the law of condemnation. So many, I just watch, sit under condemnation, coming short in the law, beating yourselves, and there's no power. You're, you're, you're done with that. You're no longer under that. You're under the acceptance and favor of God because of the work of Jesus Christ. Sin can't have dominion over you because of that. And these epithumias can can be subdued and not lead you into sin because you have something greater called the grace of God. And so I want to be a people who live under grace and the beauty and the fullness of what that means. The vision of what God is showing me 
what we could look like if we really got that and believed the gospel. The just shall live by faith. To not live under law and condemnation and self-effort and working to be accepted by God. I'm under grace. That's all for free. Okay, that's just my introduction. You want more? I, I'd go on forever on this. Loosen up just a little bit, guys. It's the Lord's day and we're looking at God's grace. Some of you look a little stiff. And just one more thing for free. In Romans 6, 12 through 13, don't let these epithemias take over and rule and reign your life. And here's what I'm seeing as a pastor. Epithemias, they're really hard to spot and they're hard to get to the root. We're ex American Christianity, we're experts at the flowers of sin and we love to hack at them. And we're not good at getting to the roots. What are the epithemias? What are the desires, these over-desires that are causing me to sin and do the things that I'm doing? And so they're very hard to, to notice. And it can take decades of you hurting people, hurting yourself. You just keep chopping at the flowers of sin and you're, you're just destroying yourself. To get to the root and apply the gospel balm is, is so big if we're ever going to walk in the freedom that God has called us to. And so we need God. We need each other. We need community to help each other flush these things out. You've got to plug into the body, the life of it, for people to get to know you really well. And when they know you, don't run away. People start to see your sins and you're like, I better go to the next church because they know me here. I had a guy literally tell me that once. I'll never be a leader here because you guys are on to me. <laughs> we need each other. In my journey, the people who stay outside the body live in these epithemias and you don't see them. And when you plug in and dig into each other's lives, you start noticing and seeing things in each other and that's where the body comes in. I got to share that with you. I got to help you. I got to pray for you. They're hard to spot. And so let the body of Christ be the body of Christ. Lifelong battles. Why am I so withdrawn from people? Why do I use people? Why do I hurt my friendships? Why am I always discontent? Community and discipleship are the outworking together of this design of God. And so I want to call you to jump all the way in and let's grow each other and help each other. We, we got a counseling ministry here. We've got leaders and community groups and discipleship. There's so many ways to, if you want to just grow in Christ and not just stay in the same place with these epithumias, fighting them all alone, all by yourself. Don't settle for letting bosom sins keep you from a fruitful life of making much of God on your way to glory. Don't, don't get comfortable and just cruise in in these things. Let's fight together for holiness of life. And as I've said from McShane, that we would be as holy as men and women and children could be this side of glory. That's what I'm seeing in Romans 6. I, I, I don't coast. I want to offer up this body a living sacrifice to God. And that's what we're learning here in Romans 6. Okay. This morning, we're going to start a new section in Romans 6 on freedom. And this is the desire that God has for us and the desire that I have for you as well. And what I see is we're a country called the land of the free, and I just see slavery all around us. And we could be such lights in a world of bondage when we come with this true freedom that we're looking at and we come into a country who, who our architect and builder is God. And so I want to pray this morning and ask him to set us free uh, in a beautiful way as we study this section of Romans 6, 15 through 23. So let's go to our God. Father, we come to you and I pray don't let one soul sit in this room and just want to study God's word and think that's the end goal. I pray that we want to come through this word so that we could be those who are slaves to Christ. Lord, that we could give our members to serve him, that sin would no longer be stronger. God, I pray that you would work in each one of our hearts. 
Lord, I pray that there would be none in spiritual bondage that hear my voice this morning. Lord, if there are any, cut the chains, break the shackles with the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ this morning. And I pray, Lord, awaken, revive your church unto holiness. I see the Lord seated on the throne. His glory fills the earth and the seraphim are saying, holy, holy, holy. God, I pray that that would be the cry of our hearts. We live in a country that the pursuit of holiness is dead. And you can't look at this gospel and not want to be conformed to the God of the gospel. I pray, Lord, that every heart would be a slave to you. Subdue it in beauty and glory and desire and the promise of this new covenant. Minister to our hearts, we pray now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, many have fought and died for freedom. Really, our whole country was built upon it. Some of you might be familiar with the movie Braveheart, where William Wallace, at the end of the movie, is being dis- disemboweled for his rebellion. And as they do it, he yells out with that blood curling cry at the end of it freedom. Freedom is the cry of the human heart, it's the history of the world. Slavery and freedom. Yet who knows what true freedom is? How few in the church itself know what the blessed freedom of the gospel is. They're they're under law, but they're not under grace, which is bondage. And I've been laboring and fighting hard to give you freedom. And I feel like I've been disemboweled during 2020 and even 2021. And I've had to ask myself, why? (laughs) Why? Well, the answer is simple, freedom. I want to give my life to make men and women free. And what freedom is to this world is the ability to do whatever I want. That's the only definition of the world's freedom. But in our passage this morning, freedom is to do what God wants truly and joyfully. That's what this gospel is. You see, to do what I want to do apart from God is the definition of bondage. And I want to show you this morning how the gospel of grace gives true freedom. To do what God wants us to do is my blessed freedom. And that's what we seek in this passage. So let's set the chapter again if you'll come with me in this section. I want to take a quick look at the forest before we go to the trees. And Romans 5 We saw that as sin reigned in death, even so grace now would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace is now reigning and ruling for the believer. It's a greater rule. And Paul now is anticipating two great objections to the gospel of grace. And we've seen this throughout the history of the world and the history of this gospel. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace might increase? If we have this beautiful grace, should we just sin then since we're forgiven and we can even give God glory because he forgives our sin? In verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? I've heard that my whole life. Come out from under law, we're just going to be lawless. What's going to happen? May it never be. We'll look at that this morning. The law can reveal sin. The law can condemn sin. The soul that sins must die. But the law has no power to break sin. It can't break its penalty. It can't break its bondage. And it can't break its tyranny. The only thing that can trump sin and set us free from it is grace. And so here's the battle. And it's a great one. The history of Israel is Torah. It's the law of Moses. Thousands of years, they've had the revelation of the will of God. It was their boast. And that's all that they've ever known. And they they were taught early in the synagogue of of Torah and how to seek to obey it. How to, well, that was the, the life of a Jew. And now one of the greatest Jews of the day, Saul, who's become Paul, is writing this letter to Rome. And he just said in Romans 6, 14, for you are not under law. Stone them. Get rid of them. 
How could someone speak such heresy? That's all Israel's known. And now you're saying we're coming out from the great commandments, the law that was given by God through Moses. Paul, if what you're saying is true, we could just live any way we want then. If you have no moral maxims and standards, this is a dangerous thing. How, how I live just doesn't matter then, Paul. This is a call to moral anarchy. And that's their argument, and it just repeats itself in different ways over the years. And I can't wait to show you Paul's answer to such an argument. So here's your outline this morning, and we'll look at it in two weeks. Paul gives us four truths for why we do not live for sin because we are under grace and not law. Verse 15, we're going to see an antagonist. Verse 16, again, we'll see an axiomatic truth. Verses 17 through 20, Paul's argument. And then in verses 21 through 23, he's going to make an appeal. So let's look first at the antagonist now in verse 15. Verse 14, last Sunday, sin should not be master over you for you're not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May never be. (coughs) Paul's answer, it's simple as, should we just sin if there's no law? Just why? It doesn't matter. Just go live any way you want. And it's the same answer, may genoita, as it was in verse 2. No way. Perish such thinking. Why? Well, verses 16 through 23, just like our last section, will be our powerful answer. So Paul's been arguing in this chapter that a life of willful sin is inconsistent with a life under grace. You've been united to Christ in baptism was verses 1 through 11. You've died to sin's rule and reign. In this section now, he's going to say you're you're a slave. You are in slavery, but you're a slave to God. Verse 16. Do you not know, same argument before, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience... You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Don't don't you know this? Don't you know this? He's reminding them. You know this very well. Well, what, Paul? What is it we don't know? Who you serve reveals whose slave you really are. It's just pretty simple. Whoever your master is shows who you're a slave to. When you present yourself as slaves of obedience, you're a slave to the one whom you obey. Who you serve is your master. You belong to the power that you choose to obey. And what you yield and bow to shows what you're a slave to. It makes me think of the classic section with Jesus in John 8. I want you to listen. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's what we're studying. You'll know freedom. And they answered him and said, we're Abraham's offspring, and we've never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you shall become free? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who is committing sin is the slave of sin, a doulos. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. <clears throat> if therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's offspring, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. And they said to him, Abraham's our father. And Jesus said to them, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You're doing the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you'd love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. And I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, it's a lie, and he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. 
But because I speak truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He is he who is of God. Here's the words of God. And for this reason, do you not hear them? Because you are not of God. If you know the Son, the Son will set you free. And you'll have freedom from this bondage of sin to the father of lies. Romans 3, 9, we were all slaves to sin. And most, every unbeliever I've ever heard said, I'm not a slave. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. And, and I, I serve just freely and joyfully. I, I don't feel a whip. I don't have chains. I'm not in a prison cell. And I just want you to hear this. If you're here this morning with that argument, that is why sin is the perfect tyranny. It's an unfelt tyranny. You're under this bondage that you can only serve self and not God. And you don't feel the bondage and know it until God begins to draw you. And the Spirit convicts of sin and judgment and righteousness. And suddenly you begin to realize the tyranny that you're under. Paul declares, don't you know? Of course you know. There are only two masters in this world. God, which he says obedience to God, and righteousness three times in this section, or sin. And so every one of us are addicts. We come into this world addicted to sin, and we call it freedom. And in our therapeutic age, to break addiction, we try things like law. We try blame shifting. We try psychology. We try everything we can. But there's only one thing that can break our addiction to sin, and it is the grace of God. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. There's no other way to break this bondage to sin that we are born into when we come into this world. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And I want you to listen to what Paul says here in verse 16. So powerful. He says it's a slavery to sin, and it says it results in death. And so this claim, I'm just so free. I choose sin. I labor at it. Paul says, that's good, but there's a payday. There's a payday when you come and you say, let me get my paycheck at the end of this this series of working, my wages. How much is my check? And your check is going to be eternal death. That's the bondage. That's the tyranny. You're, You're laboring in sin and loving it and drinking it up. And when you come to the end of it, you get eternal wrath, eternal death that never ends. Paul wants you to hear that. What a bad master that you serve, lying to you daily, saying this will give you joy, this will give you peace, this is going to end well, and it never does, and it's a dead end, and it finishes in hell. What a deceiver. What a liar. Promising you life through sin. And people just lapping it up daily, and the payday is eternal wrath. It just kills me. To hear all the junk in this day and age, express your freedom, celebrate your freedom. We color it and paint it with sophisticated words and sayings. We we spray paint our chains with gold. But the payday will make what William Wallace went through a cakewalk. The end is eternal death. Its end is the enemy tries to keep that from your mind daily. And I'll call it the most forgotten doctrine in the church today is the doctrine of hell that Jesus talked more about than heaven. The place where you will never see or sniff the mercies of God or his common graces forever, just on unending waves of God's wrath forever and ever. You tell me this isn't serious what we're looking at. So if you ask somebody, are you free? Yes. Do you realize where freedom will take you? You tell an unbeliever you're a slave to sin, and they'll laugh. 
and you tell them it ends in eternal death and they'll laugh. They will deny both. And yet Jesus tells us that both are true. I want you to look at the other end then of the slavery spectrum. You, believer, are slaves to obedience, resulting in righteousness. This leads to life. This, this, slave, ma- this slave master called Jesus uh, leads to righteousness and it leads to eternal life. I love that the, the, you can't have more opposite of who's, who you're serving. The devil and sin or the beauties of Jesus Christ. One leads to eternal death and one leads to eternal life. One leads to sin, one leads to righteousness. That's the difference in our slaveries. And so the word that Paul chose is doulos. And, and you, most of you know that word well. And it was when the, the, the slave uh, was free to leave his master. And if he wanted to stay, they'd put that little all in his ear. And that was him saying, I love my master. I want to keep serving him. I, I choose to be his slave. And this is the, the beauty of the gospel is you were all losses of sin. You loved it. You served it happily and heartily. And now we are willing bond slaves of Christ because we're going to see the change of heart. And now I I willfully, I just want to serve him. I love to serve Christ. Hear this. The reign of grace is not so that you can indulge sin, but so that you can escape it. Do you see how wrong that thinking is of these arguments in this chapter? So what I'd like to do with the rest of our time, and then the next Sunday we're together, it'll be three weeks, is I'd like to look at the argument. And if you'll start, the argument now, Paul will begin in verse 17. But thanks be to God, that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from where? From the heart. That's the whole new covenant. To that form of teaching to which you were committed. So as we begin this verse, I just want you to hear it jump out at me, but thanks be to God. (laughs) All glory be to God. It's God alone who can liberate me from sin's slavery. There's no other way out. It's only God who can take you from such a slavery and enslave your heart to him and give you eternal life. And when you finally get that, the only answer is thanks be to God. I pray every one of your hearts, just thanks be to God. Not, hey, look at my hands. Look how smart I am. Look how I maneuvered out of this. As I ponder this beautiful phrase, this is what hit me this week. It's, it's just, I, I see kind of two sets of people. And there's one set your whole life. It, it just, all I ever hear is what God hasn't done for you. You just kind of live in this daily discontentment of what God hasn't brought into your life or done. And then there's this other group that just smells so beautiful. And their whole life is taken up with what God has done for them. And I just watch them get crushed, hit, trials, afflictions, and they just keep saying, thanks be to God. They praise him and they, he just can't, he's already done so much for them that they're just content if they get nothing else. I am not on the way to hell. I have Jesus Christ. I have salvation. And it just, that, that's what they live in. That's who they are. You just got this one group that all your life is, is just God hasn't done enough for me. And you live in that day to day to day. I call that slavery. And the other one is I just live in the fullness of, I'm under grace. And I just can't ever thank God enough. Thanks be to God. Because I've been freed from sin in verse 17. And this is in the passive voice. This was done to you and for you. You didn't free yourselves. There is no spiritual Houdini. There has never been who can get out of these chains. And I want you to hear that. A little religion will not get you out of these chains. Moral reform, trying to turn your life around, will never get you out of the chains of the bondage of sin. There's only one thing that can deliver from this bondage. And it's the grace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. It's a divine passive. It's the work of God. Tetelestai, it's finished. Jesus did it. God, by his spirit and his son's work, you have been delivered from the bondage of sin. And what happened now is you became obedient from the heart. That's what the law couldn't do. The law could not change our hearts. 
So it commands, but my heart is selfish and loves it, and it's fleshy, and it's just the law couldn't do anything with that. But thanks be to God. You became obedient from the heart, and your inward man, mission control center is your heart. It's spiritual. It's been circumcised by God. It's an inward work. Your heart now is in it. And now you have a glad surrender, a glad obedience. I love that Christianity isn't obey me because you're going to go to hell. Offer up your body as a living sacrifice by the mercies of God, by grace. This is it. I'm going to take your heart and I'm going to make it new and I'm going to make it willing. It loves me and it wants to serve me. And you've been delivered, he said, to that form of teaching to which you were committed. The form, Greek word for form means pattern. It's the teachings of Christ through the apostles. It's really all of the scriptures. You're committed to it. The the gospel of Jesus Christ, the the new way of life that comes through Christ, his his doctrinal truths and his ethical commands. You're, You're committed from the heart to his teachings. You became obedient to the truth inwardly. This is the whole book of Romans, the obedience of faith. Now my faith is I obey and I believe and I love God to which you were delivered, you were handed over. It's another passive. You were delivered to the truth, not the truth delivered to you. And so here is the new covenant. I'm going to read it again to you, Jeremiah 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers and the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke because of their hearts, Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquities, and their sin I will remember no more. That's being under grace. The glorious new covenant. I'm going to take that heart of stone and I'm going to give you a new heart. And and it's going to be a circumcised heart. And it's a heart now that wants to walk in God's ways. Here I am, God. Here's my heart. Take what is yours. I want to serve you. Thanks be to God for a new heart. And I pray that every believer in this room can say that. Because I lived with a heart that hated anything to do with God's word. Thanks be to God for this new heart that's supple and loves the lawgiver and loves his laws. Truth being brought to me and my heart being joined to it. Thanks be to God for a new heart that loves the word of God and wants to receive it and believe it and follow it. I just read this week about Calvin again. Uh, during the, the Great Reformation and when it spread in Geneva. And all he did, he, he had asthma and he was skinny. It gives me hope. <laughs> <clears throat> and they would gather in St. Peter's and, and he would just preach God's word in Geneva. And, uh, and again and again, and, and they said he had no introductions, which that really convicted me. <laughs> but they said he had he, no fancy illustrations. And he just stood up there expositing the word of God every day. And the people came and came and the hundreds of churches were planted from it and the the great revival just spread all through the land. We have these new hearts that just want the word of God and we don't have to do fancy things in our day and age and manipulate and twist and make it exciting. We just lift up God's word and we stare into it every week, week in and week out. We've been delivered over to that. We don't have to be, you know, creative and do all the Hollywood things in this church. We just need in everything we do, we just try to open up this book and say, thus saith the Lord. And our hearts have been delivered over to that. That just says, teach me the word of God. That's what I love. That's what I want. I'm enslaved to righteousness. I submit to righteousness. Again, this is an indicative. This is what God has done. You're not a slave to sin. Don't walk with it. Don't fellowship with it. Don't dance with it. You've died to that dominion. You're done. God God took you out from that. 
and now you love righteousness and obedience and service and devotion to God, you have a new slavery. And it's the most blessed bondage I've ever had in my life. I love my master. I love being his slave. That's the new covenant. It's a glorious thing to be shackled by divine grace uh, to, to Christ. It's an enslaving grace, not sin. Thanks be to God. And so my friends, you are not a slave to sin, but you're a slave of righteousness. You have been handed over. And a few weeks ago when I was teaching, I brought up the movie, Remember the Titans, and I just thought I'd do it again. Great movie. They're leaving for summer workouts at, at Berry College, I found out. Jacqueline went there and she informed me that that's Berry College. So that's a neat fact. <laughs> and there's a, one of their main all-American all players, Gary Bertier. And then they, they got blacks and whites who are joining together because they've made them come together and they're getting on a bus to go away to camp. And Gary Bertier walks up and he's a white man and he comes up to the black coach, Coach Boone, and he comes to tell them, this is what you're going to do. And you're going to have the white players play these positions and here's everything. And he's telling them how this is going to work. Uh, and, and Coach brings truth to him. And the conclusion is this is not a democracy, it's a dictatorship. And all you have, Gary, is your brothers on the bus and your daddy. He said, who's your daddy, Gary? <laughs> Who are you serving? Who you serve is whether you're under sin or under grace. And I hate a Christianity that is allowing a nation to live under the dominion of sin and call it salvation. That's not in the Bible. Who are you serving? Sin or the grace of God? The conclusion is you cannot be under grace and say, shall we just sin then? That can't be the believer's heart. When you know there's no longer under law, when you know the grace of God, and if your conclusion is, I'm just going to live any way I want, you're under the dominion of sin and you're still under its slavery. Because this gospel takes a new heart. This is praise. Thanks be to God. I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. Here's my heart, Lord. It's the most captivating power and beauty that takes away your heart. And your daddy is Abba. And all you want to do is serve him. You're a willing bondservant of Christ. If there was no devil flesh in the world, man, I would have this wired. Because I'm a new creation and all I want to do is please God. Here are my members. I report, I report for service. I just want to serve the King of Kings. That's what this gospel does to a heart. And my view of Romans 7 is that there's a lot of remaining sin that's going to fight this. And some of you are fighting right now like never before. And, and we, we never fight sin very hard. And when you start to, you realize how strong it is. And I've had some of you sharing that, man, I'm in a battle. And I want you to keep learning. We're going to learn by grace how to fight and battle this sin. And so as I've been studying Romans and seeing the beauty of grace, my heart has been so overwhelmed and you want to know what's growing over the last year and a half? Is a desire to give my members to him. Have any of you seen the grace of God in Romans and just looked at that and said, I can sin. Thank you, Lord. I just hope it's doing to you what it's doing to me. Here's my heart, Lord. Take what is yours. Here's my devotion. And here's my desire. The more I look into this gospel, the more I just want to serve the one who died for us in this gospel. I can't imagine asking God with what I've been seeing, can I just continue in sin? What has been your response to this last year of looking at the treasures untold in the book of Romans? Is it let me sin more? Or let me never sin again against such love and grace. I pray you go wrestle with that this week. You will find out who is your master. 
And I close with the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism. It says that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, the blessed bondage of being a Christian. And I do care about those who are battling sin. And I'll I'll tell you that I don't want you walking away saying there's not a battle, but I want you to see the beauty of what God has done and what should be done in our hearts. And so I pray that if your whole life is just, I, 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 I don't want to serve God, but I'm afraid of hell, so I do it. If that's your life, I'm inviting you to come to Jesus Christ this morning because he hasn't circumcised your heart. But if your heart is all I do is I love Christ and I want to serve him and I got flesh that just keeps fighting me and dogging me. But, but man, when I'm not being tempted and, and I'm just alone, I, my heart, it's just God. I want to please him. I love him. That's my desire. That, that's going to show you who's your master. And so I, I pray if your master is still sin, I don't care if you got a little cross on and you got a bracelet that says WWJD, that ain't going to do anything. I pray. There's a savior from sin. He says, come to me. Come to me if you're weary and heavy laden with fighting a heart that doesn't want to obey God and doesn't want to follow him. And you be honest with your heart this morning that that's who you are. Man, there's a savior that decreed this Sunday that you would hear this and that you would sit here by the Holy Spirit convicted over that you've played a fake life your whole life just trying to do what you really don't want to do and you don't care about it. Man, there's a Savior who can save a sinner like that. If you're a 30-year religious hypocrite, come to Jesus this morning. He loves to save. He's able to save to the uttermost all who will come to him this morning. So come, quit living in the dominion of sin and smiling with everybody when you're miserable on the inside. There's a gospel for you this morning. What's he saying? I can hardly hear that. Was that amen? All right. Well, let's, let's close in prayer. And I just thank God for this blessed bondage of a due loss of Christ. Father, thank you for a new heart. Thank you that we've been delivered over to this teaching. God, that now we, we love the words of God. We delight in them. We believe them. We trust them. And we desire to follow them. God, thank you for a heart that once was dead to you. It was dead to your desires, your will for our lives. The only will we wanted was self-will. And oh, by Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit, you have broken such a dominion, a slavery that we were blind to, a slavery that was damning us, and we didn't even know it. We were laughing with our friends and drinking it up and hooting as we were journeying to eternal death. Oh, what slavery. God, thank you that you worked in our hearts and you opened our eyes and you drew us to Christ. And there we found the pearl of great price. Lord, I thank you now that he has our hearts. You've, you've circumcised these and now we love the law. We love it because of the law giver. We, we love obedience to you, your will. God, I thank you for it. I pray that you will work in each heart here perfectly because there's so many different things that are being wrestled with and battled. I pray for the weak, struggling saint who hears these things and goes back under law and sits under condemnation. God, let them come into grace where there's no condemnation. God, nothing can bring them back under that. And I pray is that let them see the beauty that they, they hate sin they hate sin, and yet uh, it's, it's battling, and it's taking them down in some of the battles. And I pray, let them learn uh, how to deal with it your way, how to be restored and walk in grace. God, help them. And I pray for the, the sweet believer who is in this battle, just wanting to, to use their members to make much of Jesus Christ. Uh, refresh them, revive them, strengthen them uh, in grace. Grace be with you and peace. God help them and bless them in this this holy war that they've entered into by by your uh, gift of life. And I pray for any who just 
are so worn out, heavy and laden, but trying to live the Christian life with a heart that loves sin, is in bed with it, wants to live with it, and just can't get enough of it. Oh, God, there's a Savior for them this morning. Please, Father, open their eyes. Unstop their ears. Give them new hearts this morning and set them free from such a miserable existence. Oh, the beauty of the gospel of grace. I pray that they would see the glory of Christ this morning dying in their place and living the life that they can never get done and to fall on that and believe and rest in that this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.